Okay, I'm going to be talking about population balance equations for modeling uh, the kinetics of polymer upcycling. Everybody's aware of the amount of plastic waste that moves through their own household. Um, it's a, a little bit shocking already at that scale, but when you think about it on a global scale, there's 8 billion tons of plastic have been produced since the dawn of the industry. Uh, these things largely do not, they do not degrade in the natural environment. You know, nature hasn't evolved any mechanisms to degrade most of these materials yet. And, and the scale of the problem is really enormous, and it's easy to get lost in, in all those zeros of 8 billion tons. Uh, but that corresponds to one dump truck of plastic waste per living human. So this really is an enormous problem. And uh, if current trends hold, only about 10% of that plastic that we've made will be recycled. So this is something that I think, uh, you know, we don't want to just put it all in landfills. And of course, a lot of it ends up in places other than landfills being incinerated. Uh, or being lost into the natural environment. So I want to talk about uh, a brief review of species balance equations as an intro to population balance equations. So everybody learned how to do these kinds of balance, uh, balance equation analysis in their introductory PCHEM courses or in chemical engineering classes. So you have on the left an accumulation of species A. Uh, so that's a time derivative of the amount of A in the reactor volume, for example. You might have streams that are carrying species A into the reactor and streams that are carrying species A out of the reactor. And then you have species A being consumed or generated in chemical reactions occurring in the reactor. That's this, uh, this term R sub A uh, that stands for your reaction rates. Uh, and then you multiply that by the uh, volume of the reactor if this is on a per volume basis, the reaction rate is, right? So you can uh, break that in a term into the concentration of species A times the volume of the reactor. And then that reduces to this very familiar equation, dCa dt is minus kCa if you're working in a batch reactor with a first order reaction. And we know that we can integrate that and find that the logarithm of the concentration should change linearly. And that's one of the hallmarks of a first order reaction if you're if you're doing some mechanistic or kinetic analysis to uh, you know, different rate laws integrate to different relationships between concentration and time. If you do this with a second order reaction, same situation in a batch reactor, so those flow terms uh, are vanishing, then you end up with 1 over Ca is linear, is a function of time. You can do this for even more complex and complex mechanisms. For example, if you have a two-step uh, catalytic reaction, like, for example, the Michaelis-Minton kinetics, then you have a few more steps to think about. Usually you have to do some quasi-equilibrium or pseudo-steady state approximation on the two steps in that mechanism in order to get an overall rate law. But then you get a rate law that looks like this, and you can still go back and cast this in terms of conversion as a function of time. And it's somewhat of a complicated relationship now, but there's a function only of conversion on the left and only of time on the right. This allows you to check for Michaelis-Minton kinetics in very much the same way. Uh, these kinds of analyses are familiar and they're very useful for process design applications. They're useful for extracting rate constants from data, and they're also useful for testing mechanistic hypotheses. So can we do that same kind of analysis for depolymerization processes? Well, in principle, yes. We can write down species balance equations for our monomers, for our dimers, for trimers, etc., all the way out to any arbitrary cutoff. Uh, we can apply the quasi-equilibrium and pseudo-steady state approximations to each of, the, of their intermediates when they're bound to our catalyst. And so, you know, in principle, we should be able to do this. But in practice, we really can't. There are too many species to count, there are too many rate equations to be solved, and there are too many parameters to fit or compute using ab initio calculations. Population balance equations really give us a framework for, for doing this kind of analysis in a, in a more convenient way. Uh, but before we dive into population balance uh, equations, let's see whether we could get by with doing something simpler. Instead of keeping track of the total concentrations of each individual molecular weight, maybe we could just keep track of the average molecular weight and how it changes versus time. So many of the early studies in polymer upcycling did exactly that. They would report the average molecular weight as a function of time. Paper after paper, they saw that initially the molecular weight would drop quickly, and then it would slow down and sort of reach a, almost like it was plateauing. There were various mechanisms put forth to try and explain this behavior. What, what we began to notice, you know, after a, a couple of years of doing this work is that 
you saw the same basic behavior in different catalysts with different polymers, and that suggested there might be something more universal going on than a deactivation or poisoning mechanism that would be specific to the chemistry of one particular process. Uh, in the supporting information of the science paper, you can begin to see a derivation of, of what's happening here. The gist of it is that at the initial time, all of your chains are long and there's not very many of them, and so each cut matters in the molecular weight distribution. At the end of the process, the chains are very short and there are a lot of them. If you're cutting even at the same rate, most of the time you're just cutting a short chain and you didn't make very much difference in the average because there are so many chains to be cut. So how can we quantify that idea that this is actually causing the plateau? Well, you just go to the definitions of the quantities. So the average molecular weight is defined by the total number of segments divided by the number of, the number of chains that they're divided into, which is basically the number of cuts that you have. That is gonna be growing from the initial number of chains that you have, plus an integral over the cutting rate that, that just integrates that in time. And so if you just combine these two things, you see that you get an average molecular weight that evolves in time, starting from the initial molecular weight divided by a one plus a factor down here in the, in the denominator that's gonna grow in proportion to the time. And, and that really always gives you a curve that looks like the one that you see in the experiments. So these are actually quite useful fits. Um, you can go to the literature and see how some of the other uh, depolymerization efforts report their results and they say, well, you know, after one hour, our LDPE was this long and after two hours, it's gone down to this shorter length and after four hours, it reaches an even shorter length still. It's a very anecdotal way to report your data in order to reproduce this kind of a data set, you really have to have exactly the same amount of catalyst, exactly the same amount of polymer. It, you know, if you, if you vary from those things, it'll become very hard to tell whether your catalyst is working the same as somebody else's. So what we've begun doing in the iCoop is using this little one parameter fit uh, to extract the only parameter in that equation that I showed you. You can rearrange that to assume that there's no catalyst deactivation and then and then everything reduces to this very simple equation with just one parameter that corresponds to the number of cuts per gram of catalyst per time. Now that is a transferable quantity that can be compared across experiments uh, in different labs with different amounts of catalysts and different amounts of polymer. In fact, you can even use that quantity to compare how different catalysts are working on the same polymer or how one catalyst works on different polymers. Uh, and so it's been a really useful and transferable way of understanding our kinetics. Uh, from the average molecular weight evolution. It also points out to you something important, and that is, going back to the original question, is it sufficient to understand mechanisms to just monitor the average molecular weight versus time? Well, if it's universal, and we haven't said anything about the mechanism in order to derive this equation, then that, that's sort of a universal feature that does not reveal anything about the mechanism. Uh, in, in a couple of places in the literature, you'll see claims, well, you know, the average molecular weight evolution is consistent with this kind of mechanism. Average molecular weight evolution is consistent with all kinds of mechanisms, and it will always do something along the lines of this curve shown here. In order to really diagnose what kind of mechanism underlies your kinetics, you really need something beyond the average molecular weight, and that's where the population balance framework comes in. Let's begin to develop population balance equations uh, by considering a, an easy case, okay? So this is gonna be homogeneous chemistry, and we're gonna think about, in 2020, thinking about a hypothetical situation where you have a homogeneous catalyst that allows double bonds on a, a Phillips-type polyethylene to migrate inward along the backbone of the polyethylene chain. And if you combine that catalyst with a olefimetathesis catalyst and excess ethylene, then what should happen is that when the double bond has moved into the interior of the chain, ethanolysis will result in a, a cleaving of that chain and cutting off a fragment from somewhere near the end, depending on how far in that double bond was at the moment when it was cut. And the reason that it's exciting is because a lot of these uh, depolymerization proposals, they result in a, in a whole bunch of different products. But this one basically converts polyethylene and excess ethylene into propylene, which is a value-added product, and it should be, in principle, the only product from this cascade of reactions. So I, I was excited by this, and I thought, you know, this would be a great system for us to model. The, the problem with modeling this in a straightforward way, if you just wrote down rate equations, of course you can do it. You can write down equations for 
the number of polymers of each length and, as, and also as a function of where those double bonds reside along the backbone. And if you do that, you find that even for short polymers, 1,000 mers, for example, you get a square array of a million ODEs to solve. And so this is really not a very practical way of, of making progress and understanding how these processes work. So we developed a, a new set of approximations, and I'm going to... It starts with something rather conventional, a pseudo-steady-state approximation on the locations of the double bonds along these chains. Uh, but then after we've made that approximation, we make a further approximation. This is our local density approximation right here, where we say that the, the chain population locally doesn't vary uh, by much as you go from one chain length to neighboring chain lengths. And that's this, that's why we call it a local density approximation. It's a DCDN, it's inspired, DCDN equals zero. It's sort of inspired by the same local density approximation that people make in statistical mechanics and in quantum chemistry. We get rid of all these time derivatives now, and we have these linear recurrence relations and solve them uh, for the uh, parameter lambda that governs the decay of the, the locations of those double bonds. What's kind of nice here is you note that this is derived from the underlying rate constants and one dimensionless parameter that combines those. Uh, that now we're summing out the locations of the double bonds and we're going to retain a set of equations now that's reduced to only remember the chain length dependence. Uh, then we use Max Planck's trick to convert uh, a system of ODEs into a, a partial differential equation uh, by going to a continuum variable. Uh, and, and we end up with a Fokker-Planck equation here. Uh, so, so this equation has terms that will look familiar to any, any chemical engineer. You've got like an accumulation term, you've got a, uh, a convection-like term, and a diffusion-like term. But I want to emphasize that the parameters in here are not phenomenological adjustable parameters. They are derived from the underlying chemistry, and that's part of what makes this little framework quite nice, is that it encodes the details of the proposed mechanism uh, from, the, from that very beginning diagram uh, that, that Damien drew on my board. And, and that's, a, that's a new capability to my, to my knowledge, what made this, a pa this paper uh, exciting to us. <clears throat> Does it work? Um, well, you can go back now and you can solve that, that Fokker-Planck equation by hand, uh, and you get these black curves, and indeed they coincide quite closely with the numerical solutions in, in color behind them of the, of the ODEs that describe the evolution of each individual species. And so, so it appears that it, it does work pretty well. You can use the, the Fokker-Planck uh, solutions to calculate analytically, again, the rate at which the system is going to be making propylene, and you get a, a, a nice compact expression with only a couple of parameters. Remember that those are parameters that are tied together by the underlying, their relationship to the underlying kinetic parameters in the model. And we get, um, you know, a prediction that the propylene production rate stays approximately constant until these chains get so short that they can't be cut down anymore. And then it, it drops off as the entire distribution of chains uh, reaches that threshold and then drops to zero. What does the experiment see? Well, they see very similar behavior, actually. So in September of 2022, uh, Hartwig's group, along with uh, Alex Bell, uh, published this paper in Science Magazine. You see molecular weight distributions that look a lot like the ones that we predicted. You see the production rate of propylene. This has been integrated. Uh, so instead of seeing a flat rate of production, they're seeing an increasing amount of propylene produced and then a flat line corresponding to the cessation of propylene production. Uh, but, but more or less the same kind of behavior uh, that was predicted in the uh, theoretical paper. The theory was two years uh, ahead of the experiments in this case. You know, we were very excited about that, but the Berkeley team did not cite us. If you put in their significant statement and pull out their keywords and you put them into Google Scholar, our paper comes up as the first hit. They, they didn't do a, a lot of reading to figure out what had already been done in this area. So Damien was was working on this uh, independently, trying to do experiments to, to show that this could be done. And their paper came out just one day later. So there was you know, a little bit of a, a rush to generate publicity on this, and a lot of uh, press releases were written by both teams. The press releases also kind of forgot us. Uh, but the important thing is that technology really has uh, the possibility to make a difference in this area. And you know, all of this excitement about these two experimental efforts did uh, alert people to the existence of our paper.
um, which you know went from went from like two citations prior to now scores of, of citations. Uh, we have continued to examine this thing from a theoretical standpoint. And one of the efforts that the, that the experimental teams were still struggling with is the effort to try and combine three catalysts in this, in this process. So I talked about the isomerization and the metathesis combination, but in principle, you should be able to accelerate the process further by adding in a dehydrogenation catalyst, which would give you more uh, chain ends to do the isomerizing ethanolysis as dehydrogenation proceeds. And so that's an exciting idea. And indeed, you can theoretically show that these two processes have a synergy with each other. There's also a, a sort of a, a downside to this, and that's that the synergy is not perhaps as big as what people initially thought. Um, it appears that you cannot achieve theoretically any better than about three to five fold synergy beyond what you would get by just doing these processes in stages. For example, doing the dehydrogenation and then doing the isomerizing ethanolysis. The staged process, even though it's theoretically a little bit slower, it has the advantage that the catalysts, they don't cause deactivation of each other, and they also allow you to separately optimize the conditions in each of the two, the two processes, uh, which given that these catalysts are somewhat fragile, uh, seems like an important consideration. So that was just one of many possibility, possibilities in terms of overall mechanistic families for how to do depolymerization. Now, in this paper, uh, in 2022, we outlined that there are potentially like 16 other mechanism categories, uh, mechanistic motifs, we call these, that you could think about. And of course, you can begin to think about how to mix those in together, uh, but we'll get to that later. So you can have a catalyst that's homogeneous or heterogeneous. It can have the polymers uh, dissolved in a solvent or in a melt. You can have scission happening at the chain ends or at random locations along the chain. And you can have processive uh, scission, or you can have non-processive scission. And each of these categories has its own population balance equation with its own solutions, and you can think of those as fingerprints in the shape of the molecular weight versus time uh, curve. And that's really where we begin to be able to use the, the balance equations, not species balance equations, but now population balance equations, to diagnose what the underlying mechanism might be. Metathesis and double bond migration is just uh, just one example that was homogeneous chemistry. The two catalysts combine to do an end cut that is non-processive, and the, the polymers in that case, at least in the theoretical analysis, were in the melt. What about population balance equations for heterogeneous catalysis? This is you know the way that most of the processes that, that our team and the ICOOP has been has been exploring things. Past work, you have lots of examples of population balance modeling and lumped kinetics modeling where you go straight with a, a pseudo homogeneous rate constant that takes you straight from the bulk species distribution to the products. But in, in principle, what's really happening is that those species in the bulk have to first adsorb on the surface of the catalyst. And then uh, the way that they're adsorbed on the surface of the catalyst and the preferential adsorption of different molecular weights, notice the green distribution on the surface does not have to be the same as the blue distribution out in the bulk. Uh, those determine the ones on the surface determine what is going to be cut into products. And this is, I think, a really important idea. If you want to have control over product selectivity, you have to be able to control which polymers from your bulk distribution are going to be preferentially absorbed and how they contact the catalyst. Will they contact the catalyst only on the ends of the chains or will they be able to lay down flat on the surface and then likely get cut at any random location along the polymer backbone? So what if you have a heterogeneous catalyst, the polymers are dissolved in a solvent, and they're going to be randomly cut because they're allowed to, to lay flat on the surface of the catalyst. You know, if you want to displace solvent molecules, a whole bunch of solvent molecules, you're going to have to have a better enthalpy of interaction with that catalyst. Uh, that's going to cause the enthalpy to dominate the absorption behavior. And because of that, the long chains should bind first. And that should have the effect of cutting long chains over short chains and thereby focus the molecular weight distribution. In contrast, if you have polymers are in the melt, now the catalyst is always in contact with polymer segments. Uh, and it doesn't really care anymore whether those chains are long or short, because if whatever segment it's interacting with leaves, uh, it's just going to be replaced by another segment. So now enthalpy of adsorption becomes a kind of a moot point and everything should be dominated by entropy of adsorption. 
And of course, the, the polymer should give up more entropy to adsorb when it's long, and so that should drive adsorption, preferential adsorption, or that right near the catalyst surface, we should find a, a larger fraction of short chains. If there are short chains present, they will tend to find themselves near the catalyst surface. As soon as we start cutting chains from the bulk, we get more short chains available, and those short chains will produce near the surface. They don't thermodynamically want to leave the surface. They will stay there, and they will get cut again and again and again, leading to a situation where we're producing gases before we've begun cutting up uh, the long chains that are present in the, in the melt. And, and I think, indeed, there's a lot of the early reports uh, where people were taking ruthenium nanoparticles and platinum nanoparticles and just putting them exposed on off-the-shelf supports, uh, this is exactly what was happening. They were making a lot of methane in early stages, and the polymer was still uh, largely intact. So how does nature get around this problem? How does it cut long chains into very specific fragments and, and not just, you know, continue to use that reactivity to keep cutting the, the products down further and further into secondary reactants? Well, here is one example that I learned about from work with, with Greg Beckham on cellulose uh, and cellulases. Uh, so the cellulose is the green strand shown here, and it adsorbs into the pore within this enzyme, the cellulase enzyme, that's called a binding cleft. And the cellulose chain basically fills the entire binding cleft, and then the active site is right here near the end, uh, where, near the end of the pore where the, the yellow arrow is pointing. And so what will happen now is that the, the polymer will be cut here. It cleaves off a cellobios unit, a disaccharide, and very precisely clips off a disaccharide. And now the disaccharide has smaller enthalpy of binding to the, to the, uh, to the catalyst, to the, to the enzyme, than the rest of this green chain. That's probably just because the disaccharide is smaller than the rest of the green chain that occupies the pore. And so the disaccharide leaves. And that creates an opportunity for the green chain to reptate deeper into the, the binding cleft, position itself to be cut again. So this is a, a processive mechanism because the substrate does not absorb, get cut, and then desorb. It absorbs, gets cut, gets cut again, gets cut again, gets cut again. And it does this basically until the substrate uh, polymer chain is gone. And then, and then the pore is empty and ready to take in a new substrate polymer. So can we design a system that would do this synthetically for polyethylene. Well, this was kind of, you know, the inspiration. We were thinking about this in the early days of the iCoop work and, you know, recognized that there should be some kind of design similar to what, what cellulase does. And so this is our sort of, uh, you know, no chemistry at this point back in 2017, but the idea is there that you have an active site off-center in a long, long, narrow pore. The polymer, if it has an enthalpic attraction to that pore, should load into the pore, reptate into position, cut a small fragment away, and then and then go back through this processive cycle over and over again. Wen Yu Huang and, and Aaron Sado at uh, Iowa State University figured out a way to make polyethylase enzyme. It's actually a whole bunch of active sites. Uh, it's an it's a uh, mesoporous silica around a non-porous silica core, and right at the boundary of those two, you have platinum nanoparticles. So if you go down these long, narrow pores, they're not to scale here, they're about 100 nanometers long and about two to three nanometers uh, in diameter. Uh, if, you, if a polymer enters one of these pores, it can really only touch the active site at the very end because it doesn't like hairpin configurations. They, they cost excess entropy to make those. The preferred binding mode is to have an end adsorption in, in this uh, configuration, and then, and then you're only cutting off these little pieces, and you basically cut the entire chain down uh, to small fragments then, and then the, the chain is just gone. So this is a, a little kinetic model, taking you all the way from that uh, processive cycle, uh, a microkinetic model of that processive cycle where you're threading and cutting and expelling a, a fragment over and over again. You can work out how fast an engaged polymer goes through this cycle. Pretty, pretty simple little rate expression. Then if you multiply the size of the fragments that are being cut by the turnover frequency for going, going through this processive cycle, you get the rate at which an engaged chain is getting shorter as a function of time. That's this m dot. And that becomes a parameter in the population balance equation for those pores 
that are occupied by polymers. And now you have an adsorption problem to think about the possibility that polymers can come in and out of those pores as well. Of course, we would like for them, once they're engaged in a pore, to stay there and continue to go all the way through this recessive cycle. But there's some possibility that they will, they will exit first and then you get partial processivity. These are coupled by the adsorption and desorption to the population of polymers out in the bulk. You're basically working with this continuum of molecular weights, and yet you see things that are reminiscent of classical catalysis formulas. For example, the active site coverage corresponds to this little quantity psi, uh, phi star, which looks like the competitive adsorption isotherm for an empty site. Uh, kind of neat to see these analogies popping up. You know, we've gone from something like an elementary steps in microkinetic modeling all the way to the population balance equation again, and it encodes all those details of the processes between. If you have a highly processive catalyst, you pull chains out of the bulk, you completely digest them, turn them entirely into monomers, and because of that, you don't see any buildup of intermediates. If you lose processivity, then you pull chains from the bulk, you cut them a couple of times, and then you let them go back into the bulk. And because of that, you have this soup of intermediates forming as you're increasing your conversion. And, uh, and of course, there are process engineering implications of this. You know, your reactant mixture at the beginning of a process will be very different as, as the process goes through. Whereas over here, if you could have a processive catalyst, you would just keep adding polymers to this, to this mixture and the properties of that thing would not really change. One of the things that, that we began to worry about as we worked on this was if the catalyst resides in the liquid, then anything that evaporates uh, during the reaction is going to effectively be protected from further reaction. And, and this could actually be an advantage, and I'll get to that later in the talk. This was partly take our predictions for the molecular weight distribution and compare them to the experiments and having to think very carefully about, well, the sample was drawn during reaction conditions at 300 degrees C, but then it was cooled before it went into the GC, and, and of course then there's some condensation. And so we had to think about, we have things that are gases at reaction conditions and gases at room temperature, things that are liquids at reaction conditions and the room temperature, and then we have solids that only form after everything is cooled down, and we have condensates that were gases, but once things cool down, they condense and they become liquids again. Okay, so how can we build a kinetic model to understand how these things are happening for this recessive catalyst? Well, this pore should prefer to host long chains rather than, than several short ones. And so you can build an equilibrium model for that. We have this K swap parameter that says how strongly do we prefer to have solid molecular weights engaged in a pore than to have these liquid molecular weight species engaged in the pore. And then this model looks kind of complicated, but it's actually not. It's just accounting for the typical molecular weight of the things we call liquids, typical molecular weights of things we call gases, the typical molecular weights of those in-between things we call condensates, and we're converting solids into the liquids, liquids into the condensates, and liquids into the gases. We never convert condensates into gases because the condensates are in the vapor phase at the reaction conditions, and they don't encounter the catalyst. So this is the beginnings of a sort of reactive separation model where you really account for the two-phase nature of the catalyst and reaction mixture. You know, there are only two parameters in this model, and we're predicting three curves here, so there's also some uncertainty in the experimental data points as well. We don't start making gases until the solid is gone. And, and that gets back to this idea uh, that I already mentioned uh, that, you know, one of, the, one of the things that we wanted to get away from with the design of this catalyst was having a melt exposed to the nanoparticles right there in the open. Because then you should start cutting the short chains before you've digested most of the solid material. And, and that's, you know, a recipe for making methane. And you can see that we don't really make any methane or other gases uh, until we're out, till we've completely converted all of our polymer polymer waste. So, uh, so that that was a pretty exciting little development. I think it's a, uh, and I think it really inspired us to go a little further and try to think: Can we put more details into this, and can we really begin to account for the vapor liquid equilibrium in a more proper way? You know, it's important to recognize that these reactors have liquid and vapor phases, whether whether we mean for them to or not.
And it's really important to account for both fractions in your mass balances and in your selectivity assessments. And there's a really wonderful paper here with a bit of an unfortunate story behind it. It's a, it's a retracted paper. And, you know, it's, it's nice work. We had nothing to do with this retraction. I think the authors have really done, done the right thing here and recognize that the way they assessed uh, their selectivity to a particular product, propane, uh, hinged upon an assumption that the vapor, the fraction of propane among their products in the vapor phase would be the same as the fraction of propane that was dissolved in the melt still. That is, is not going to be true. The Henry's constants for these species are all different. In fact, that's a log scale, and so they're really markedly different uh, Henry's constants for these things, and it's important to keep, keep track of those. So this analysis here, putting all of these Henry's constants for solubility in the polyethylene melt of different different volatile alkanes, uh, was done by my undergraduate, Chinmay Sasrabude, uh, at the University of Illinois. There's a little code here where you can do this analysis yourself and account for the different compositions of, uh, using this little fractionation equation. It's a standard chemical engineering equation to do this, uh, but I think it really highlights the, the, the important relationship between the complex molecular chemistry that's happening in these, in these systems and the reactor engineering concepts that are tied inextricably from the interpretation of results. So here you see that in order to understand what fraction of my particular product is in the vapor phase, I need to know what the volume of my headspace is. I need to know how much mass of polymer melt I have. I need to know the Henry's constants for those things. And of course, I need to know the temperature. And, and you know, all of that is done for you in this little Python code that, that Chen Mei has, has made available on the web. You can find that uh, directions to that in our, in our paper in Langmuir 2024. Now, the other aspect of this that I want to highlight is that, again, the gas phase, species that go into the gas phase are no longer contacting the catalyst. And we can really exploit this idea to affect a sort of reactive separation in these processes. So imagine that you want to do hydrogenolysis on polyethylene. Uh, you have a melt and a catalyst at 300 degrees C, and above that you have some headspace filled with heavy volatiles initially. Uh, if you can pull those out of the reactor before they have a chance to redissolve and interact with the catalyst again, then you can really drive your selectivity towards heavier products. Uh, let's see that on the molecular weight distribution scale. You start way out here to the right with very long chains, and those are being cut to smaller and smaller sizes, and eventually they get to cut down to a size around C15, C10 or so, where they have some volatility at 300 degrees C. And then they begin to evaporate into the vapor phase. If you pull them out, you should be able to save them from being cut down to light gases. Uh, so how do you formulate equations that describe this process? Well, this is a population balance equation derived by Andrew Kim, a postdoc in my group. This particular equation is keeping track of the liquid phase components in this process. If you set the alpha equal one, that fractionation factor to one for all species, and you set the dam color number to zero in this equation, then you have turned off outflow and you have only allowed the system to have one phase. So this is the, the thing that people sometimes assume is happening, but is not really happening in most reactors. Single phase reaction, you start with long chains. In this case, this is a random scission model. These are being gradually cut down to smaller and smaller sizes. If you set the dam color number to zero, but you allow the alphas to be non-zero, then you're modeling a two-phase batch reactor. And now you do get some preservation of the diesel middle distillate species, we call them, diesel and, and gasoline components. You end up with a vapor-liquid equilibrium at long times. If you, of course, keep all three terms, then you're modeling a semi-batch process where you started with some polyethylene and as species go into the gas phase, they're being pulled off by an outflow stream, and that is it, that is all all uh, wrapped up inside this dam color number is the outflow velocity. Uh, so you can see what what happens in this process. If what you wanted was middle distillate species, diesel and gasoline, C8 through C25, then the one phase reactor design is terrible. The two phase reactor design does a lot better, and the semi batch reactor design does even better still. Our experimental partners been really wonderful to work with a team who gets excited about about hypothetical scenarios and uh, theoretical analysis and goes and builds a reactor and, and tries this stuff. So they have shown that indeed if you compare a two-phase reactor 
in batch mode to a two-phase reactor. In semi-batch mode, you indeed get a little boost in productivity of these middle distillate species. And it also suppresses that light gas formation. But it also shows the, you know, the value of having a modeling component in your effort. You know, really we're able to anticipate these fractionation effects and, and reactive separation processes were going to be happening and build a model, uh, build reactors and test for it and account for it. So one of the, the long-standing goals of this work is to be able to build these population balance models uh, directly from DFT and coarse grain simulations. Now I want to emphasize that's not what I've been showing you so far. So far we're writing down mechanisms, we're building in the the phenomenological rate laws for those mechanisms into our population balance equations, which was already in advance over what had been done before. But it is not quite at the level where we're parameterizing those mechanisms using DFT calculations or the adsorption isotherms in these models from coarse grain AMD simulations. But in principle, the framework is now there. You can write down population balance equations for various different scenarios, and you can identify the, the parts that can be modeled effectively with coarse-grained MD and the parts that can be modeled effectively with DFT, and we should be able to plug those kinds of results in and get a, a true multi-scale description going all the way from quantum chemistry and molecular interactions all the way up to the reactor level analysis with macromolecules involved. Let me show you an example of one of the challenges that you encounter when you try to do this in practice and a strategy that we have put together for uh, trying to overcome that. So consider hydrogenolysis of polyethylene over zirconium hydride on silica. And this was discovered by Basset uh, back in 2008. The challenge here is to build and solve a microkinetic model with thousands of different macromolecular reactions. How, how do we do that and actually use quantum chemistry in order to put in all of these rate constants? Uh, well, what we're going to do is adopt this three-step modular microkinetic modeling strategy. We know that eventually, if you think about how the rate of a given reaction occurs uh, for an for a adsorbate on the surface, all of these adsorbates are going to have long alkyl tails corresponding to whatever polymer they came from and its molecular weight. As the molecular weight increases, of course, it matters whether that's an ethyl tail or whether it's a methyl tail or whether it's a propyl tail. But eventually you'll reach some point where, you know, your tail is 10, 10 methylene units long, where it doesn't really, doesn't really matter if you make it longer. The rate of the reaction happening at that surface site is going to be impervious to that. And so what we want to do is to build cluster models of our catalysts, walk through all the usual analysis with a small model compound, but then instead of using partition functions for that small model compound, we want to use rotation and translation parts of those partition functions that have been replaced by a Kuhn segment. Now that's the statistical length of a polymer chain that, that we, we no longer correlated to the direction and position of neighboring of neighboring segments along the chain. They begin to be, behave just like freely jointed chains and, and we think that that length scale is probably the appropriate one to use uh, for saying that beyond this length, it doesn't really matter how long you make the chain anymore. So we want to work out rate constants for that particular length, and, uh, and that should all come in through the rotation and translation parts of those, of those rate constants. Then what we want to do is to walk through the usual analysis, except that instead of keeping track of individual molecular weights as we do the, uh, the microkinetic model construction, we keep track only of the, the features of those molecules. So this should allow us then to write down a rate law in terms of the hydrogen concentration, the concentration of segments, and the concentration of end units along those chains. And the rate law in this case comes out to be, uh, to be this thing. Of course, the theta h and theta s here are very complicated expressions. But we can now go back and rely on stoichiometry and say we're still agnostic to how long these chains are, but I know that every time I do hydrogenolysis, I consume a hydrogen molecule and I consume two of these middle segments, and I create two new chain ends. And now that allows me to go back and say, that was the rate at which I was uh, making cuts uh, at random locations along the chains. Now here's where the polymer molecular weight distribution comes back in. What is the probability that that cut that I made 
was attacking a CC bond along an inmer. You can write down this just in terms of a, a, a random cut model. So this is the this is the death term, and this is the birth term in our in our population balance equation. And then over here in the in the birth term, we have one more factor that is the probability that cutting an n primer generates an inmer. Uh, there are two out of n prime places on the chain to do that. And if you put all this together, you get a population balance equation that looks like this. Reminiscent of random cut type population balance equation, you'll notice it's not quite the same. So there's some extra math here that has to be done. And uh, we're looking forward to doing all of that as we as we wrap up this effort. Uh, this is the project of my graduate student, Leela Manis, whose name is not on the slide. So the, the point is, is that now with that population balance equation, we have a framework of going all the way from our DFT calculations uh, and microkinetic modeling machinery to the, uh, the macroscopic molecular weight evolution in a reactor of a, of a given type. So I'm going to wrap up there, and I want to uh, thank all the members of my group. I want to thank the Department of Energy for funding this work through the ICOOP EFRC. These are the names of all the students who work on the project and the particular parts of the project that you saw and, and what they've contributed to these. I want to thank some excellent collaborators, Aaron Seydow, Susanna Scott, Wen Yu Huang, uh, Max Del Ferro and, and Lapointe, uh, Damien Yerane, and also the undergraduate Chin Mei Sastrabude, who did the Henry's Law tabulation and uh, made, a, made critical contributions to the reactive separation work.